Well, let me add, add my welcome as well. And, uh, and uh, the, some of the past programs we've had, you might want to glance at the back of the program for today. We've had some terrific uh, sessions here. And this is a time to remember if you've been here before. And uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, personal, if you like, about uh, past visits here. You can complain about the food. You can, uh, uh, you can uh, comment on the various sessions we've had. The first one we had was in 1988, uh, as already indicated, the stock market crash of 87. What have we learned? 10 years later, we had the same conference. 10 years since the crash, what have we learned? Uh, uh, the second conference was the Dewey Dane Conference on International Financial Policy. We've had a lot of conferences in Dewey's honor. And a lot of retir retirement conferences. That, was, uh, that one dealt with uh, Latin American debt crisis, balance of payments issues, uh, uh, and uh, derivatives. Uh, it was a, a broad-based uh, and very uh, excellent conference. In fact, there was a book that came out of that one. Uh, we've had conferences on securities markets. Uh, um, I might note one of our guests here today is uh, George Yuzhu from the New York formerly from the New York, where's George? From the New York Stock Exchange, and uh, Jim Cochran, who is, uh, who is a frequent attender, was also at the New York Stock Exchange, had to call in. Uh, his doctor wouldn't let him travel. I hope he's doing OK. He's certainly a great friend of the, of the center and the, and the various programs we put on. We've had conferences on odd eights. Uh, 95 was securities market reform. Where's Bill Christie? He's here somewhere. Um, so um, uh, we've had a wide range of, uh, of, of topics that we've covered. And this uh, conference is intended to be a bit of a potpourri to cover a variety of topics, ranging from macro money issues to uh, credit, uh, credit risk and sovereign risk to uh, securities markets and operation of securities markets and securities transactions. Cause. So, uh, in an attempt to be representative of what we've done over the last uh, 25 years. Um, let me say a few words about logistics. All the sessions are in this room today and tomorrow morning. Um, meals, we'll have lunch today and tomorrow outside and the table outside. The table's outside. Can you hear me, by the way? Yes, it's a, no problem. Um, the uh, post-conference activities, hiking for those hikers, tennis. If there are any tennis players here, let me know. We need to get a few more tennis players for Friday afternoon. So if you're a tennis player, come see me. And we'll set it up. And Dewey is the host for the tennis tournament at his club, and it's always enjoyable. Even if you don't play tennis, and if you're here Friday, you can come over and, and uh, have a drink or two. Um, hiking is going to be run by Rick Cooper. Is Rick here yet? Rick, Rick Cooper will be here to, to be in charge of the hike. Um, I think that's all in terms of logistics. Any comments or questions? on that issue. Uh, let me, uh, I think we're on schedule, let me then turn to the program, uh, which uh, will be led off by Don Cohn. Don uh, has been a frequent visitor, thanks very much to Dewey's urging and his connection to Dewey. Where's Dewey? What are you, way in the back. <laughs> OK. Well, Dewey, uh, Don has, has, has participated in many uh, sessions of Dewey's course uh, where he speaks at lunch and then speaks to the students afterwards. And we're delighted that he's able to come and speak to this conference as well on the subject he knows very well, the changing monetary policy over the last 25 years. He is a 40-year. <laughs> veteran of the Federal Reserve System, uh, known for his sage advice to the, to the board uh, as an advisor to the board and ultimately became advisor and vice chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, he has got a PhD from the University of Michigan. 
uh, and uh, has written and thought about these issues for many years, and we look forward to his, his discussion and, and uh, interpretation of where we are and where we're, where we're heading. So Don, let me turn it over to you, and, and uh, do you want to email your, your slides? Can you guys hear me? Okay, oh, don't worry about the clip one. All right, it's a great pleasure to be here. Hans has invited me several times and I had to retire before I could, retire from the Fed before I could finally make the conference. It's great to be here for, uh, for the 25th annual. Um, I hope like Dewey, I could be back for the 35th and 45th and 55th, <laughs> go on forever. Um, <laughs> Given me, Hans gave me a very uh, short topic, uh, easily to co cover in half an hour, right? How has monetary policy changed in the last 25 years? Let me uh, start by saying I'm going to concentrate on the U.S. and the Federal Reserve, but I think a lot of what I'm going to say uh, applies to monetary policy in a variety of particularly advanced economies over the last 25 years. I thought maybe we should start by thinking about where we were 25, 26 years ago. We had just come through a very deep recession. Uh, Paul Volcker had taken over the Fed in 1979, and he had, through um, dint of very high interest rates and the deep recession, broken the back of a very, very severe inflation spiral. By the time we got to 1987, we were at 4.5% inflation, down from 13%. Uh, I think breaking, that was a very difficult period to go through. Uh, unemployment got to 10% plus, but it certainly set the stage for a couple decades of good growth. It was absolutely painful but necessary. At the same time, I think that while uh, we kind of knew what we needed to do to fight inflation. We were still struggling to come up with a way of running monetary policy, of keying policy decisions. The uh, disinflationary period under Volcker, policy decisions had very much been keyed to the growth of the monetary aggregates, M1, et cetera. Uh, it was pretty clear that deregulation, it's very much the subject, deregulation, innovation, and financial markets, very much the subjects of these conferences had undermined uh, whatever relationship there might have been, a close relationship, predictable relationship between money supply growth and inflation or money supply growth and spending. And so uh, I think we were still looking for how to run monetary policy, realizing the M's weren't a very good way to do it. And we weren't very transparent about what we were doing. We didn't announce the decisions we'd made, the markets had to figure it out from what we were doing in the markets or in the open market interventions in the, uh, that the New York Fed did. Uh, there were two forecasts a year released, but they were uh, very limited and a couple of testimonies by the chairman. But there, there, the monetary policy was not very transparent. There was concerns that transparency might limit the flexibility of policy, might bring some political pressure to bear that otherwise wouldn't be there. So there was a reluctance to be transparent. I think everything, lots of things changed over the next, uh, over the next 18, 18 years. And I would call this the, the golden age of monetary policy. Now, of course, at the end of this rainbow wasn't a pot of gold, right? <laughs> it was a, big, a pot of something else, maybe. Um, this isn't being recorded, is it? Uh, right. Um, and uh, central banks went to something that was called flexible inflation targeting. So the intermediate variable, the variables that were used to key policy decisions were the forecasts of future inflation and output relative to the objectives of price stability and, and high employment. 
because the economy settled down after this very severe inflationary period in 1970s, in the 1970s, economic forecasts were very poor. Uh, they did not predict the course of inflation. But by the 80s, expectations had settled down, economies had settled down, and forecasts were, were much better. So you could use the forecasts of inflation and output to, uh, to key your monetary policy decisions. There were a number of nice things about that. You were forecasting your ultimate uh, the goals that you're after, price stability and high employment, so your policy could be directly key to what the legislature had told you you were supposed to be, supposed to be doing. And uh, they were flexible in a couple of dimensions. One is you didn't have to aim at your inflation goal every period. You could be flexible about how often, over what time period you would meet your inflation goal. And you were flexible in the sense that these were forecasts. They were expected to change as new information came in and you got new uh, ideas about where the economy was going. You were expected to react to that and monetary policy would, would react to that. I think in that part of the uh, flexible inflation targeting, paradigm is that there was an implicit in the United States or in many other countries explicit priority given to uh, hitting inflation targets. A recognition that low and stable inflation price stability was the responsibility of the central bank, that the central bank had the tools to achieve low and stable inflation and that pursuing low and stable inflation was the means to achieving high employment. A stable, uh, a stable economy, a stable inflationary economy encouraged businesses to hire, and that was the way to full employment. So there was at least an implicit priority on, on inflation, recognized by certainly Paul Volcker, Alan Greenspan, and Ben Bernanke. They all voiced this view. In the United States, as I noted, we ended in 1987 with a 4.5% inflation rate. Everybody recognized that that was probably still too high, but there was not a uh, great push to push it down to two. The idea of the so-called opportunistic disinflation was 45 was pretty low. Uh, if as it drifted lower, you would kind of uh, realize those gains cement them in and not allow it to drift higher. So policy was very focused on not allowing inflation to rise from the four to four and a half percent range and then as it drifted down to two to three and two to make sure it didn't rise from there but there wasn't an active push to push inflation down. We became much more transparent about what we were doing in 1994. We began announcing the decisions of the Open Market Committee right after the afternoon that the decisions were made and those announcements over the 1990s and 2000s became much more elaborate, explaining the rationale for what we were doing. The minutes of the meeting were released earlier. The idea became expectations are important, markets are important, channel through which policy is being transmitted to the rest of the economy, and it's, it's critical that markets and market participants understand what we're doing. So the more they understand what the Federal Reserve is doing, the more they're likely to work in sync with the Federal Reserve in a stabilizing way. If they're trying to guess at what the Fed's doing, they'll probably just put volatility in the markets. So there was definitely a move towards having the markets and the Fed kind of work together towards stabilizing system. And the more they understood, the more that was likely to, likely to happen. It produced, this period has often been called the Great Moderation, actually from 1983 to 2006, often called the uh, Great Moderation. Uh, there were only two mild recessions. After a number of years, think back to the 1950s and 60s and 70s, in which there were recessions every couple years. We went for 25 years with two mild recessions, one in the late 90s and one in the early early 2000s, late uh, 80s, early 90s, one in the early 2000s. So recessions seem to have become milder and much less frequent. Inflation did get down to, in the twos in uh, the 19, uh, late 1990s and it stayed there and in 2006 it was at uh, 
two and a half percent. There were periodic financial crises, otherwise you wouldn't have been able to have these, uh, these uh, conferences where you examine what went wrong. Uh, so uh, that there were things going wrong right in the financial markets. But the feed through of those things, the 87 stock market crash, the credit crunch in late eight, 1980s, early 1990s, the so-called uh, 50 mile an hour headwinds that were impeding the flow of bank credit to the economy, uh, the dot-com bust in, in the early 2000s had an effect on the, on the real economy, but it was kind of a limited effect. And I think it was limited for two reasons. One is the U.S. financial system was well diversified, so if the banks got in trouble, the securities markets could take over some of the burden of what the banks were doing. And when the securities markets got in trouble, LTCM, for example, the banks could take over some of what the securities markets had doing. So the so-called spare tire uh, way of looking at the financial markets. And the second point was that the uh, the the Fed, the Fed, I think, had um, an ability to lean against those particular financial market crises and cushion their effect on the economy because they weren't severe enough. There's a lot of um, been a lot of research on why the why the uh, why the good results of the Great Moderation. Uh, some of it's due to economic structure in terms of inventory management, technology, etc. Fewer bad surprises. So we there were shocks, but not of the nature that we had in say the 70s with the oil price shocks and some others. But also, I think monetary policy played a role, be, being forward-looking, looking through small changes, paying very close attention to expectations. One of the lessons in the 1970s was, and the macroeconomic literature that grew out of it was the importance of expectations. And the Fed started paying very, very close attention to, uh, to inflation expectations as we executed policy in the uh, in the uh, 80s and 90s and 2000s, and that keeping those expectations anchored meant that you could be even more aggressive leaning against bad things that might happen to the economy because uh, you wouldn't have to worry about inflation expectations going up. The risk management strategy of uh, monetary policy, look at what the worst outcomes might be and take account of those, lean against some of the really bad outcomes and you'll control those or at least you'll lessen the opportunities for that and the transparency that I talked about. I think an unfortunate byproduct of the good behavior of the economy uh, over the uh, uh, 80s, 90s, and 2000s was a huge buildup of risk and uncertainty. We became complacent both in the private sector and among the regulators. Maybe Pat will talk about this a little bit. Um, uh, we thought markets were more self-correcting than they were. We thought the risks were distributed and we thought monetary policy could clean up the messes, but that obviously isn't what happened when we finally got to the, to the crisis. So I don't wanna talk about liquidity programs or lending, but I did wanna put a bullet up there to note that uh, they were an important part of our response. What I want to keep talking about, however, is monet monetary policy. We reduced short-term rates very aggressively as the economy became, as the recession began in late, uh, I guess the peak was December 2007, and we started re reducing rates very aggressively in January 2008, and of course, once after Lehman, we reduced interest rates to zero uh, very, very quickly. Uh, we moved aggressively because we were trying to break the spiral between the financial markets, the downward spiral, the adverse uh, spiral of the financial markets and the real economy. And we thought if we cushioned the real economy, we incented spending through low interest rates that might help stabilize the financial system as well. A lesson we drew from Japan was they had behaved, they had been very, seemed to be very reluctant in lowering their interest rates. It happened slowly, things got ahead of them, so we should be very aggressive in lowering interest rates. 
But then by the fall of, uh, by November, December of 2008, our short-term interest rates were at zero, and the question was what to do now. How do we ease financial conditions? How do we encourage spending when we've already used all the scope we had for moving our traditional monetary policy tool, which was the federal funds rate? And I think the logical extension of moving the federal funds rate was to move out the yield curve and start moving intermediate and long-term interest rates. <clears throat> so we began buying mortgage-backed securities agencies and treasuries over the winter of 08, uh, 08, 09. The idea was that um, this would, taking duration out of the market, well, first of all, at that time, I guess, the mortgage-backed securities market and the agency market was not very liquid. So <coughs> intervening in that market helped that market get up and running again, and that was important for housing in the United States. Going out and buying treasuries had a somewhat different motivation because treasuries, of course, were trading an extremely liquid market. The idea was taking this duration out of the market would incent private sector to uh, lowering those interest rates would induce the private sector to move out the duration risk curve, uh, credit risk curve, drive down interest rates for a variety of borrowers as uh, investors took on more, more of these longer term riskier assets lower interest rates, just as when the Fed lowered the short-term rate, this is another way of lowering long, intermediate and long-term rates, reducing the cost of capital for spenders. Lower interest rates help to elevate equity prices and other asset prices, just as they do when you lower short-term interest rates, and they tend to put a down, somewhat downward pressure on the dollar. So I think it's important to look at these purchases of long-term bonds as uh, a lot, in my mind, a logical extension of the decreases in short-term rates that the Fed had ordinarily used, usually used to fight recessions when short-term rates were already at zero. Whether uh, most of these purchases have been financed by issuing bank reserves to uh, to banks on the uh, <clears throat> on the liability side of deposits on the liability side of the Fed balance sheet. More recently, they've been financed by selling the T bills on the asset side, the so-called Operation Twist. It doesn't really matter. The logic of this is taking the long-term securities off the market, adding a bunch of reserves. The the link between reserves and credit and money was broken. Along, it was never very strong, even in good times, and it's been broken in, in, these, uh, in these crisis times. So there's a huge volume of reserves out there. The banks are doing some lending, but they're not really responding to the huge volume of reserves. So it, it's a classic liquidity trap, as Keynes had, as Keynes had talked about. Uh, have they been effective? I think they have been effective at um, reducing long-term interest rates, elevating equity prices, even making the dollar a little softer than it otherwise would be, and therefore uh, increasing exports. Have those easier financial conditions fed through to uh, spending? I think that link has been damped. It's been damped. Obviously, I mean, we've had zero, we've got a zero real long-term interest rate in the Treasury market. If Pat and I had been discussing this five years ago at the Federal Reserve and we said there will be zero 10-year rate, what will happen to the economy, we would have predicted a boom, right? And it's not happening, and I think it's not happening in part because of the housing sector, which is always has been in the past one of the things that leads economies out of recession, and it's still impaired for a variety of reasons. It hasn't happened in part because state and local governments have been cutting back there. So while the private sector is expanding, the public sector is shrinking, and that's a headwind. It hasn't happened because of events overseas that you'll be dis we'll be discussing later in the conference, say, in, uh, in Europe, uh, impinging on why the U.S. economy hasn't gone. And there's just a huge amount of uncertainty. Challenges ahead. Um, I think 
monetary policy in the golden age, as I called it, certainly didn't prevent the crisis. Uh, that's obvious. Price stability does not guarantee financial stability. But I don't think we should not lose sight of uh, some of the important lessons that I pointed out during that time. That uh, low and stable inflation price stability is a prerequisite for good growth. And increased uncertainty about inflation has got to be a negative. Forecast-based policy is how you have to go. Monetary policy works with long and variable lags. You've got to be looking at your at your forecasts. You've got to be flexible about using those forecasts. I think the risk management ideas, some of those ideas back there on the previous slide about what was good about policy remain good about policy that just wasn't enough to guarantee, um, to guarantee uh, financial stability. But the crisis does and has raised a number of questions about how monetary policy has been run. Um, as some of them involve, should the objectives of the Federal Reserve, of the monetary authorities, not just the Federal Reserve, of the monetary authorities be adjusted? One uh, <clears throat> aspect of that has been the concern that the Federal Reserve with a dual mandate, price stability and maximum employment, will lose control of inflation. Certainly the Republicans in particular and the Republicans primary debates in particular uh, seem to express a lot of concern that all those reserves would eventually end up in higher inflation. And there has been a move in Congress, uh, Congressman Kevin Brady of Texas, to change the <coughs> mandate of the Federal Reserve just to concentrate on price stability, take out that um, maximum employment. My own personal view is that it's not necessary. The inflation record of the Fed of the United States is not significantly different than it than of Canada, the United Kingdom, the Euro area, uh, Sweden, New Zealand, all those inflation targeting countries. And I don't expect it to be considerably different in the future. I think the Fed will exit in a timely and effective way when it's time to do it. But those concerns are there. I think you could rewrite the law in a way that conformed to what I said earlier, that gave us something of a priority to price stability, but didn't, but did not tell the central bank to ignore what's happening to growth and growth and jobs. So I do think the ECB seems to be an example of a central bank that just pays attention to price stability. I'm not sure that's serving the euro area all that well these days. Going somewhat the other way is price stability did not, was not enough to guarantee financial stability. A conversation I had last night with uh, one of the people here suggested that maybe the golden age wasn't so golden because of what happened at the end and that part of the reason that we got in trouble was that monetary policy was too easy and that monetary policy ought to give some weight to financial stability when it sees credit bubbles uh, forming in the economy. So uh, you might think as the Fed, let's go back to the mid 2000s, the Fed was right on target with its inflation. Uh, we did not suffer high inflation except for some periods of petroleum price ups and downs, right? Um, but we had this terrible bubble in housing prices and in credit to finance housing. So should the Fed have steered away from its price stability mandate, raised interest rates, tolerated lower below target inflation, tolerated higher unemployment to fight that, um, to fight the instability there. This is a point that I think Martin Wolf brought up yesterday in his FT, in his FT column. My personal view is that uh, we've created a new tool, macro prudential policy, regulatory policy that takes account of, tries to take account of these imbalances building in the economy. I would prefer to use that rather than interest rates to fight bubbles and imbalances if that, because uh, interest rates are a very blunt tool, 
They affect lots of different things. You may not like house, what's happening in the housing sector, but if you raise interest rates, you're gonna hurt business capital investment at the same time. So if we have a tool that could look at and aim at the housing sector and the problems happening there, that ought to be the first choice. In the end, if that doesn't work, then perhaps you have to use monetary policy, but I think there are other tools we ought to use first. And finally, there was a lot of complaining when the Fed was easing, uh, particularly the second uh, large-scale asset purchases from emerging market economies, that we were, easy monetary policy in the United States was having a disruptive effect on economies overseas, and we should take account of those disruptive effects when we were making monetary policy. There are now IMF spillover reports to get fed into the G20, G20 process. The theory here is we should steer away from our own objectives to reduce the collateral damage around the world. I'm not convinced. I think our first responsibility is a strong and stable U.S. economy. I think the other countries, and it wasn't just emerging market economies, the, uh, I think the German finance minister also had some words for uh, the Federal Reserve. I think the other company, countries and economies have their own tools they can deal with the spillover effects, and uh, we need to get our own house in order, let them deal with whatever happens as a consequence, and not think that there's some huge cooperative solution for the global economy, which I'd be highly, highly skeptical about. And the very final point is, in all this heated uh, rhetoric about the Fed and QEs and debasing the currency, I hope we don't lose sight of the long history that suggests that independent monetary authorities are absolutely essential. Some arm's length relationship to the political process. We live in democracies. We have to be accountable in those democracies. But there has to be a bit of an arm's length relationship for policies to be successful, to take a longer view, and for policies to be successful over time. All right, thank you. That was thank you very much. Longer, longer than I expected. I think we have a couple of questions. Yes. I was thinking more, uh, not necessarily the Fed, but the authorities. So more in terms of capital required, for example, or LTVs, loan to value, setting ceilings on loan to value, or loan to income ratios. Um, I, don't, I don't see, I, I don't know, I think the whole Fannie and Freddie thing has to change, will change. So I don't see changing that subsidy, but I do think the, inter, the intersection where the Fed and the other authorities can get involved is where these markets touch regulated financial entities. And by, uh, you know, and with 2020 hindsight, if something had been done about Countrywide and WAMU and all those other folks making those risky loans, um, and, then, uh, and then Citi and others taking them onto their books or putting them in off-balance sheet entities that ended up on their books, I think in, if we had approached it from that direction, uh, we would have damped down a lot of what went on. And then uh, I, I know there's a risk that if you damp down in the regulated sector, it migrates to the unregulated sector. I think the so-called shadow banks. So I think there are tools we can and should use for that. So I'm thinking more of a regulatory environment that would, if it didn't damp the housing bubble, would at least make the institutions making those loans more resilient to the subsequent collapse. Is that what you mean by macro prudential? Yes. Yes. I have a question about this uh, monetary policy and the effects on cap reformation. Because uh, how long can you sustain uh, the zero interest rates and not rewarding depositors, savers, and investors? How, what's your view on that? Well, I think there's definitely negative effects, obviously, on savers uh, from having these very low interest rates over an extended period of time. Uh, 
And I think of um, not only savers like I'm sure our parents and grandparents have been complaining to us or to you as they have been to me about the fact that they're not getting the returns on their accounts that they used to get. Um, but think about pension funds and insurance companies. You guys think about it more than I do. Um, and I, I can uh, imagine that these low, think, particularly in the pension fund area, as so longer these low rates persist, the more they're going to have to save and not spend it. So there are definite offsets. When I, uh, negative offsets from having these uh, low interest rates, when I think about the counterfactual, suppose in order to help savers, I started raising interest rates. I just can't get out of my mind that this would be a negative. To the extent that those savers and those pension funds held equity, equity prices would go down, right? To the extent that houses were, house prices were beginning to stabilize and houses were an important part of their net worth, I think house prices would resume their decline if interest rates went up. And to the extent that it was more expensive to buy a car, build a machine, I think that. So there are lots of negatives from these low interest rates. I just think there'll probably be at least for a little while now, more negatives from higher interest rates. It's a terrible position that we're in. And you wouldn't want, the idea is, let's not go here again. But being here, there aren't any real good choices. Yes? I have uh, two quickies. I was interested in your discussion about how commenters had noted or argued that interest rates were too low for too long prior to the financial collapse. So I think taking the second first, the MBS portfolio is insured by Fannie and Freddie. So the taxpayers might have a, I mean, it's all about Fannie and Freddie and what their exposure is to. The Fed is not exposed to the underlying okay, mortgages. They don't have any, they don't have any private sector. Um, right, well, right now they're mo mostly owned by the U.S. government. Okay. And uh, it's a t that's a, you know, a bad thing, but it happened. So I don't think there's any risk on the Fed's balance sheet from that perspective. Going back, yes, the Federal Reserve did, we began raising interest rates in mid, early 94, I think, uh, and raised them uh, at, a, at a measured pace, right? So it was, that was the language we used. It was like 25 basis points a meeting. So they went up quite a bit in 94, 95, into 96, I believe. I think they went up into mid-96. I don't know that, I don't remember what the shape of the yield curve was. Um, but I do, uh, you raise a note. So the Fed was tightening in retrospect. If you talk to John Taylor, he would say we weren't tightening fast enough that there was at least some headline inflation because of what was happening, petroleum prices that were higher. It's not worth getting into an argument with John Taylor on that, but we were tightening for sure. Now, at the same time, Alan Greenspan was pointing to what he called a conundrum, and the conundrum was long-term interest rates didn't seem to be responding as much and were unusually low given the level. I don't remember whether it was inverted or not, but the level of interest rates, long-term rates were unusually low. And the explanation, an explanation for that was an inflow of capital from China. So you had the Chinese buying huge volumes of U.S. Treasury and agency securities in an effort to keep their exchange rate from rising. And that excess saving, the, what Bernanke later called the global savings glut, uh, was definitely holding down intermediate and longer term interest rates and as a consequence I think it as much as or more than I would say monetary policy contributed to the rise in housing prices since houses are are purchased with uh, longer term Isn't assets. it also at that point where housing finance got very creative and created oh, it was, products and right. products 
So I think the real, the real problem was the loosening of the standards, uh, the aggressive pursuit of subprime mortgages, the slicing and dicing into AAA tranches uh, and super senior tranches to satisfy demands for very uh, safe assets, and then those being those long, even those long-term safe assets being financed with very short-term money, money market funds, uh, tri-party RP, et cetera. So you had a big buildup of leverage, a big buildup of maturity mismatch, and the system, as soon as the value of the underlying collateral, the mortgages and houses behind them, was called into question, it was a recipe for a run, and that's what we got. Marty. So the Federal Reserve in the fall of uh, 2007, I think it was part of TARP, I'm not sure, was given the authority to pay interest on reserves. That was an important point because that gave us, has given us a way of uh, tightening monetary policy by raising that rate even with a lot of reserves. So it, it was a critical uh, change to allow the Federal Reserve to be much more aggressive in supplying reserves because it knew it had an exit strategy. This is something we'd wanted a long time. Now, what we're paying is, um, still we, even a year and a half afterwards, I don't know about you, Pat, but it's hard to break 40-year habits, um, paying 25 basis points. Um, I don't think that's a big deal. Uh, I don't think that's really discouraging. If, if banks thought there was a decent <coughs> risk-adjusted return from lending to businesses or households, 25 basis points wouldn't be a big deal. I always thought, personally, that we ought to consider lowering it when things weren't happening. Um, people with knowledge of the money markets and the financing markets and Fed funds markets always had three or four hundred reasons why this was going to destroy something. But I thought it was symbolic having that there and wondered why it was as high as 25 basis points. The last time I stood at this lectern was at one of Dewey's many retirement parties and Paul Volcker was sitting there. The question he asked was, why are you paying 25 basis points on the, on the, uh, on the reserves? So great minds, Marty and Paul, think alike. Thank you very much. Soup and Reg, which is a, it's kind of a new thing for an economist uh, who is uh, really on the research side who would come down here frequently to our conferences and explain derivatives. Was the derivatives guy at the board? Was the advisor to the working group that was established after the uh, after the '87 crash? And always a very sensible approach to the uses and uh, the appropriate regulatory policy towards derivatives. Uh, now, he had to apply all this stuff and deal with the actual implementation of regulatory policy. I'm looking forward to hear what he has to say about all that. Pat? Thanks, Hans. As, as uh, Hans mentioned, I, I've come to this conference a number of times uh, over the years, but back when I was in research, uh, I think uh, uh, back then, I think I would always have spoken from a handout, and one of the unfortunate uh, consequences of being head of supervision for two years is greater caution, so I prepared a speech, but I'll try to make that as, as uh, minimize the pain associated with that, and I think it'll be sufficiently short. We'll have lots of time for questions, and I'll, I'll try to make my, uh, my delivery less than completely painful. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about banking supervision and regulation not over the last 25 years, but really what's happened since, since the crisis, um, and in particular focus on capital, which I think is, is appropriate. Um, you know, I think one of the problems with the, the response uh, to the crisis is that the causes of the crisis uh, remain the subject of heated debate. I think there's some very simple explanations. Some blame Wall Street, some blame the GSEs. 
I certainly, Wall Street and GSEs played a role in what happened, but when I uh, read such simple explanations, I hear axes grinding. I think I was impressed that in a, in a very sober review of academic and popular uh, analyses of the crisis that Andrew Vole prepared for the Journal of Economic Literature, he summed it up by saying, no single narrative uh, emerges from this broad and often contradictory coll collection of interpretations. And that has been, I think, uh, a problem in trying to finance the, finance the response to all this. The way I see it, there were weaknesses and risk management failures throughout the financial system, uh, including in the most heavily regulated sectors, including the banking system, and failures both by the banks themselves and obviously by the regulators. Uh, sort of building on something that Don said, and we didn't uh, coordinate, I think the root cause was complacency born of decades of financial and economic stability in which the brief episodes of instability that we had were promptly and seemingly effortlessly contained by the Federal Reserve and other policymakers, or I think as the columnist uh, Robert Samuelson has put it in the Washington Post, it was the belief, the belief in that great moderation that, that Don talked about and the belief that that would continue uh, that sowed the seeds of the Great Recession, and it has many, many manifestations. But I think arguably the, the most consequential risk management failures were the failures by the very largest global banks to maintain adequate capital and liquidity buffers to absorb uh, some of the initial shocks to the system, notably the loss in market confidence and securitized credit that occurred in the autumn of 2007. And again, that was a failure of the banks, but also clearly of their, of their regulators. It was only when that occurred, when those banks pulled back from providing credit to the non-bank financial sector and to households and businesses that what was a financial sector disturbance rapidly morphed into a global economic decline. So I think it's entirely appropriate that I've been asked to focus on bank supervision and regulation, how they've been evolving. Um, and it's also appropriate I've been asked to focus on capital, because I think that is sort of the central issue for, for banking regulators. In that regard, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, and highlight uh, some of the Federal Reserve's new requirements for capital planning and stress testing of capital ratios, which I regard actually as the most significant post-crisis innovation by banking regulators. Um, but I'll make and maybe I'll just anticipate the question a little while ago about leaning against credit bubbles and what banking regulation can do. Already, some of the stress tests that we're doing because they take into account in estimating losses in a bad environment, what the credit quality characteristic of those mortgages are. They look at the FICO score, they look at the loan to value ratio, and obviously the higher the loan to value ratio, the weaker the FICO score, the bigger the projected loss, and therefore the more capital. So as the E standards, there is sort of an automatic stabilizer built in. Um, time will not permit me to go through all of the changes in banking regulation since the crisis. Um, um, I think the one thing I'm going to talk about, though, in addition to capital, is the post-crisis focus on planning for the failure of even the very largest, most systemically important banks. I see the principal goal of so-called resolution planning is making it credible to the creditors of the largest banks that losses can and will be inflicted on those creditors without significant disruptions to the broader financial system. Without such credit credibility, market discipline on global banks will remain weak and ineffective, as I believe it was leading up to the crisis. And without effective market discipline, uh, bank regulators, I just think, face a daunting task. Uh, I just see banking regulation as, as being much more complex and difficult, to, more, perhaps, than uh, commentators in, in the press at least do. And as far as I'm concerned, bank regulators need all the help they can get from market forces. From another perspective, I think the financial crisis occurred both because government regulation uh, failed and because private market discipline failed to constrain risk-taking by banks and other financial intermediaries. And the public policy response to the crisis needs to address both of those failures. And so, uh, well, what about bank capital regulation in, in the wake of the crisis? Um, well, both in the United States and abroad, that's, that's been, a, been a real focus, uh, especially uh, tightening the requirements applicable to what are called systemically important financial institutions. Uh, the Dodd-Frank Act, in fact, requires the Fed to impose what they call enhanced prudential standards, including capital standards, on systemically important financial institutions, which the Congress defined for us to include all U.S. banking organizations with 50 billion or more in assets. I think not because 
um, anyone really thinks that a $55 billion bank is going to threaten the global financial system, but I think to avoid drawing a very clear line between the ones that are systemically important and not. And in addition, uh, Dodd-Frank creates something called the Financial Stability Oversight Council. One of their duties is going to be to identify any non-bank financial institutions that uh, it believes uh, pose a threat to the financial stability of the United States. That then triggers their being regulated, essentially like large bank holding companies by the Federal Reserve. Now here in the whole area of capital, I, I think we recognize the importance of international regulatory coordination, especially at least for the large globally active banks. So most of the initial work at strengthening capital requirements uh, took place in international for through the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. And the result of that uh, is this set of international agreements that are now commonly known as Basel III. I, I could easily get lost in the weeds of Basel III and want to avoid that, but I want to just say generally it's intended to increase both the quantity and the quality of bank capital. Uh, in particular, a lesson that we learned the hard way during the crisis is that in times of stress, uh, creditors and counterparties of those banks are intensely focused on common equity ratios as a measure of bank capital adequacy. And they gave little or no credit to other capital instruments, even though those instruments may have been counted as capital in broader regulatory definition. Um, so uh, really, going into the crisis, uh, at least uh, uh, in terms of the minimum requirements, a large bank could have had an equity capital ratio as low as 2% of risk-weighted assets. There was a 4% minimum for so-called tier one capital, and, but only sort of the predominant half or more of that had to be equity, so as low as 2%. When we did analysis of historical data uh, that looked at at what point in terms of when their ratios get, how an equity ratios get low, banks begin to get into trouble. Uh, while uh, you know, there's no bright line here, obviously, uh, the view was that historically, if it got less than 4.5%, then that was uh, a point at which uh, often the institution was not viable. So Basel III really sets the new minimum common equity requirement at 4.5%. Now, in addition, um, it creates what's called a capital conservation buffer of 2.5%. Um, the idea here is that, so if you had the 2.5 to 4.5, that gets you to 7%, and there's something called a uh, surcharge for globally systemically important banks that can take that all the way up to 9.5% or more. But the reason they call it a buffer is the notion is that, in fact, the bank if it fell below that, the banking regulator would not force it to go out and issue common equity, rather would expect it to restrain its capital distributions until it restored a ratio up to, to fully satisfy the full um, buffer. I think the thing there is that we recognize that, I think inherently, capital requirements can be pro-cyclical and that when the bank falls below the capital requirement, it tends to pull back from lending and that can, in fact, create an economic environment uh, that, that leads to further losses and, and can be destabilizing. So the hope is that uh, uh, by um, treating the bank differently when, when it's in the buffer, that they'll feel that they can use that buffer. I think whether that turns out to be the case uh, very much we'll only learn with time. I'm also not going to go into, I mean, obviously there are lots of troubles with the, me troubles with the measurement of so-called risk-weighted assets during the crisis, and there's been a lot of work to, to tighten that up. Uh, notably on, on trading assets and securitization exposures, um, but uh, I could easily get lost in those details. Uh, and the important uh, thing to recognize is that uh, there was a lot of concern, particularly as these requirements were being developed at a time when the U.S. economy and the global economy still hadn't pulled out of the recession, uh, about the potential impact of new higher regulatory requirements on the cost of availability of bank credit and therefore on economic growth. So the way uh, the authorities tried to address those concerns was to include less stringent, stringent transitional requirements. In fact, the new requirements under Basel are not fully phased in until January 1st, uh, 2019. Uh, I think given that, at least in the United States, banks seem likely to be able to, or most banks, nearly all banks, to meet the new requirements as they come due through internally generated capital rather than external share issuance, which rightly or wrongly, banks proceed to be much less costly than actually having to, to go externally for funds. Um, Dodd-Frank, on, on, on the other hand, does not permit such a lengthy transition for implementation of these enhanced standards. In general, uh, 
uh, the, the timetables for regulatory reform set out in the law are, are, are very aggressive in, in, in all sorts of areas. In this case, the heightened prudential standards have to be in place by January 2012. So what we've done is that until the Basel III requirements begin to bite, uh, such banks are going to be held to an enhanced set of capital standards that the Federal Reserve actually set out last November is part of something called the new capital plans rule, and that's the thing I really want to focus on. Uh, like, like, like Basel III, the capital plans rule limits the bank's ability to make capital distributions unless it maintains a buffer over a regulatory tier one common ratio, in this case, and somewhat confusingly, said 5% of risk-weighted assets, but in this case, measured in a different way, measured in the, in the old, less stringent Basel I way. But I think importantly, unlike Basel III, the size of that buffer is being determined by stress tests, including a supervisory stress test that really look in great detail um, at the actual characteristics of the bank's loan portfolio and securities portfolio. We're collecting uh, data at a level of granularity that's, that's orders of magnitude beyond what bank supervisors ever uh, ever collected so that uh, we can better assess uh, in a stress scenario just how many losses they would they would incur. Uh, there is a link to Basel III in that the capital plans rule does require that a bank's capital, uh, the bank capital plan include a demonstration of its ability to maintain steady progress toward meeting its Basel III requirements. We're not insisting that they meet them ahead of time, but that if you essentially looked at where they are today and where they have to be in 2019 and you drew a straight line, that they're sort of staying above that straight line rather than waiting to the last minute to conform. Now that capital plans rule builds on previous stress testing exercise, uh, notably including the 2009 Supervisory Capital <coughs> Assessment Program, the original stress test undertaken in the middle of, of the crisis. Going forward, such exercises under Don Frank, Dodd Frank will have to be conducted at least annually, and then the Fed, I believe, will conduct them more frequently in the event of unanticipated de deterioration in the economy or the financial system. It essentially, something occurs that suggests that the last annual stress test results are no longer uh, 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 accurate. Uh, I do think such exercises are the best way to avoid the kind of complacency that, as I indicated, I believe was the root cause of financial crisis. Banks will be consistently asked to focus not on how their portfolios have been performing recently, but rather how their portfolios might perform in a pretty severe stress scenario, uh, even if, even if uh, recent experience would, would seem to suggest that such a scenario is unlikely. Now, in March, the Fed disclosed the results of its first review of bank capital plans under this new rule. In general, the results suggested that large banks would be able to uh, weather a very severe economic and financial shock, including a severe recession in the United States, very sharp declines in equity and housing prices, and an economic contraction in, in most other major countries. A few banks uh, in this analysis would not be able to meet one or more minimum capital requirements if that shock occurred and they did not pare back their planned capital distributions, and thus in those cases their capital plans were rejected. But I'd say even in that case, I think all the, all but one of the 19 banking companies that we looked at, if they cut back their capital distributions, they would still be able to stay above those minimum ratios, even, even in the severe stress scenario that we looked at. Now, banks, understandably, I think, are not entirely pleased with such intrusive reviews of their capital distributions, having to come to the Fed uh, uh, to get approval for what they regard as, as uh, uh, sort of a core responsibility of, of the board of directors. Um, however, I expect that over time, as the particularly as our su supervisory stress test methodologies become more transparent, fewer and fewer plans will be rejected in the process that will at least seem much less intrusive. Uh, in a recent speech, the Fed's Governor Trullo indicated the Fed will be consulting with academics, other analysts, and the banks themselves regarding substantive and procedural improvements to stress testing models and procedures. Indeed, I think recently they announced uh, uh, five or six member group of academics uh, chaired by Frank Diebold at the uh, Wharton School who will be looking uh, and providing uh, a view of the models that, that we, we use. But not we, that the Federal Reserve uses. I don't the same. Only not 40 years, but 30 years still still breeds bad habits. Um, however, the Governor Trull did note a tension between the desirability of providing more information to the banks 
and the importance of not turning the bank's own capital planning uh, processes into mechanical compliance exercises. Now, the fear is that if they knew what our models were, they'd just use our models. Uh, I think that's uh, not a good idea because inherently, no matter how how much uh, we try to take into account portfolio characteristics in those models, there will be always be idiosyncrasies in the in the bank's old portfolios that our model is being applied to all the banks won't capture. And secondly, uh, obviously, they have tremendous uh, uh, risk modeling capabilities within the institutions, and, and I don't I think we'd be deluding ourselves to think that we can do better than, than all of those banks. Uh, I do suspect that over time the Fed is going to feel compelled to be clearer about the models uh, and will need other ways, find other ways to manage this, this tension, this concern that uh, Governor Trill has identified. I think in particular, beginning next year, uh, Dodd-Frank is going to require not only the Fed uh, produce fairly detailed summaries of its stress test results looking at potential losses in this supervisory stress scenario, but the banks themselves are going to have to publish their stress tests. And obvious, obviously, when the two different, the firm stress test and the, and, the, and the supervisory stress test show very different results, inquiring minds are going to want to know why that was. And there's no way they can answer that question without knowing a whole lot about how the regulators are modeling uh, potential losses. So I, I suspect things will evolve there. Um, so enough for capital. The one other thing I did want to talk about is resolution planning, because I think the, this is quite important, um, often misunderstood, and, uh, and it's something where, unlike uh, stress testing, capital planning, the note, uh, as I indicated, I think the approaches will have to continue to evolve. Um, I think a good part of the work is behind us. So I think in terms of resolution planning, uh, it's just starting. Um, and it's going to be a big focus, not only at the regulators, but at the banks themselves. And they do seem to be taking it very, very seriously. So as I noted at the outset, in addition to strengthening government regulation of large global banks, regulators need to take steps to restore market discipline by convincing creditors and counterparties that such banks are not too big to fail. Uh, actions taken during the crisis, I think, probably reinforced the belief that global banks were too big to fail. Uh, lacking tools to shield the financial system and the economy from the potentially disruptive effects of failure, authorities in the United States and abroad repeatedly intervened to avoid failure and to shield creditors from losses. The only exception to that, of course, was Lehman Brothers, and the traumatic effects of Lehman's failure only served to underscore the huge costs of a disorderly failure. So here's where... Uh, in fact, just uh, earlier this week, I was in Chicago on a panel with, uh, with, with Tom Sargent and two other University of Chicago business school people and some people from the industry, and I find myself in the peculiar position of being the defender of Dodd-Frank. And, of course, I'm not sure I like everything about Dodd-Frank, but <laughs> the one thing I, I do think is quite important and useful, and I would take issue with people who are critical of it, is Title II of the Dodd-Frank Act, which provides new tools that should allow systemically important U.S. financial institutions to fail while avoiding, avoiding the trauma to the financial system and the economy that has led the, the authorities too often in the past to feel they had to bail them out. The real key tool for facilitating an orderly failure, and I think those are the two key words, that they're going to fail, but it's going to be orderly, um, is the authority for the FDIC to create a bridge institution, a, a temporary firm to which the assets and liabilities of a systemically important bank could be transferred and temporarily funded by the government. Now, the FDIC has been analyzing how best to use this new, new, new authority, and it recently has expressed a preference for something they call the single receivership and internal uh, recapitalization model. Under this model, and as required by Dodd-Frank, the parent holding company of a failed systemically important firm has to be placed in receivership. So uh, the shareholders of the parent company are going to be wiped out and management, management must be sacked. So some of the most odious aspects of bailouts, if you, even if you want to call this a bailout, which I don't think is right, uh, just can't occur. But the major operating subsidiaries of the parent company would be transferred to the bridge institution and would continue to operate as going concerns. Thus, the bridge would continue to provide the financial services that the systemically important bank had been providing that made it systemically important. Um, and uh, the transfer of derivatives and repos and other security financing transactions to the bridge would avoid the disruptions to market liquidity that would occur, occur if counterparties of the failed firm liquidated the collateral and terminated and replaced the derivatives contracts, as would happen uh, 
at least as currently, um, under the bankruptcy code. But at the same time, holders of the equity parent, again, would be wiped out, and holders of, of long-term unsecured debt of the parent company would be converted into equity holders in the bridge. Uh, so they clearly would bear the risk that losses occurred that, that wiped out the equity holders and went beyond that. Well, provided the parent company had ample long-term debt outstanding, and I'll return to that point, at the time of its failure, conversion of such debt into equity would create market confidence in the bridge. It also would protect taxpayers from losses and would provide holders of long-term debt issued by the parent company with a pretty strong incentive to impose market discipline on risk-taking by the parent company and its subsidiaries. Uh, of course, this is predicated on the existence of an ample amount of long-term unsecured debt. Now, if you look today, most of the parent companies and most of the very large bank holding companies have lots of long-term debt, unsecured debt outstanding. Um, but obviously that could change as the implications of the single receivership model became better understood and as those creditors uh, you know, became more seriously concerned about the risk lost. Uh, I mean, it is true, I think, in an argument some in the private sector have been advocating this model point out that you do avoid the fire sale of assets and therefore from the point of view of the bondholders, you argue it would be better off than what happened with Lehman Brothers where everything was, was liquidated in a disorderly way and they had horrendous losses beyond what anyone might have anticipated from, from the failure of the firm. But I think in the absence of confidence that that single receivership model will be employed, they still hire, assign a higher probability to a government bailout that would protect them from any losses. Indeed, uh, a sign that, that regulators have not yet won this war is that the credit ratings assigned to the largest banks by the rating agencies still incorporate a ratings uplift of several notches uh, because of the perception that long-term creditors would be protected from losses because they are too big to fail. So in some sense, uh, authorities will, will, uh, uh, will can't, certainly can't declare victory until that uplift disappears. I think if, if debt holders become confident the single receivership model will be employed, the cost of long-term debt could rise significantly and absent regulatory constraints, large banks presumably would be inclined to reduce their amount of long-term debt outstanding. So, and even the quantitative uh, liquidity standards that are part of the new Basel III would not ensure that the parent issues sufficient long-term unsecured debt to ensure there's enough loss absorption capacity there to make this approach work. So I think to ensure the effectiveness and credibility of this single receivership approach, um, the U.S. authorities are going to have to introduce requirements with respect to the amount of long-term debt outstanding at parents of very large banks. So it would essentially be a, another uh, uh, capital requirements of sort imposed on top of the existing requirements. I think also they're going to need to deal with some very complex cross-jurisdictional issues that arise uh, because most very large U.S. firms have substantial operations outside the United States and there is a risk that placing the U.S. parent into receivership is again I noted is required to use the orderly liquidation authority could trigger a disorderly liquidation of the U.S. firm's non-U.S. operations because that's going to be governed by law in the foreign jurisdictions regardless of what, uh, uh, what U.S. authorities desire. There, the good news is the, the FDIC is working with foreign authorities to identify and mitigate such risks. I think in principle, they ought to like the single receivership model because it would give confidence to them that the operations of a foiled U.S. firm in their jurisdiction, which are in this operating sub or in a branch of the, of the bank, uh, can be safely allowed to continue in operation. But in some cases, insolvency laws in those jurisdictions could force suboptimal outcomes. It may trigger uh, the, the local, local legal entity going into uh, uh, liquidation or it could allow counterparties on derivatives and securities financing transactions and whatnot to terminate those contracts regardless of what U.S. law may say. So um, I think there, uh, just to sum up, uh, I think there are two, you know, there's lots and lots going on. It's real easy to miss the forest for the trees, but I've really highlighted two important initi initiatives. One. Uh, the Federal Reserve has implemented this capital plans rule that will force banks and supervisors to take a more forward-looking approach to capital adequacy that discourages complacency through its emphasis on stress testing. And second, the FDIC is developing this approach to exercise of the Dodd-Frank orderly uh, resolution authority that 
has the potential to restore market discipline on large banks by making orderly failure uh, a credible outcome in the eyes of its creditors. So I hope we still have some time, and I'd be pleased to take questions. Right. I mean, right. Uh, I, I, I think fortunately we don't really have to rely on the FSOC for some very important things. A uh, uh, couple points. One, always a debate about what we mean by the shadow banking system, but a lot of that was concerned about uh, large institutions like Lehman and, and, and Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley being not regulated as bank holding companies. Well, today, of course, even even though the FSOC has yet to make any determinations, all of those all those firms, as I uh, as I say, were converted at the point of the sword uh, to believing they should be bank holding companies, and and all of them are. So they're already subject to those same standards. Broader point: um, much of the shadow banking system was created by the banking system uh, to avoid regulation. So, for example, classic example: the ABCP markets. Um, those existed only because banks uh, basically provided liquidity and some degree of credit support to those vehicles. They all had backup lines of credit except the so-called sieves. Um, and even among the sieves, most of those sieves were sponsored by banks. There's some exceptions to that rule. But again, much if you think that's the shadow banking system, creation of the banking system, regulation is being modified to, to make sure that uh, they can't avoid uh, regulation by using those vehicles. Repo markets. People talk about repo markets as being in the shadow banking system. Well, the borrowers in the tri-party repo market are broker-dealers. Uh, prior to, to, the, to the crisis, uh, again, you had big broker-dealers, uh, uh, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, et cetera. They were not part of bank holding companies, but even then, the lion's share of that repo borrowing was done by broker-dealers that were parts of bank holding companies. And today, Virtually all of it is done by, by. So it isn't really true to see it, it, it's unregulated. To be sure, we don't yet set margin requirements on, on tri-party repo. Uh, but there is a regulatory effort that doesn't really depend on the FSOC that's, that's uh, seeking to address that. I think Governor Trullo yesterday in a speech mentioned that um, the other point is that tri-party repo markets are facilitated by the two clearing banks, both of which J.P. Morgan and Bank of New York. Uh, both of which are subject to extensive regulation, and I think it's just a matter of, of the Fed developing a clear vision of the direction they want that to evolve and then, and then using the tools it has to make it happen. So uh, without suggesting that the shadow banking system won't continue to be an issue, because obviously as we tighten regulation on, on, on the regulated sector, there'll be, there'll be uh, an incentive for it to pop out, but much of what people call shadow banking already is subject uh, to regulation. Yeah, I don't think 
uh, I mean, I think there are people who are thinking about that, but that's, that's the next generation or a step beyond what's currently. Been. Other than, obviously, the severity of the stress scenario they're being asked to test against. Um, the reason it's so severe is, is, is our recent experience, and the recent experience was so severe in part because of those very interconnections you're talking about. So uh, it, it, in some level, that is being factored in, but not in the kind of a systematic way that, that, I, that I would agree is desirable. But um, I suspect it'll be some time before uh, uh, anyone, certainly the Federal Reserve, but probably even academic researchers have, have gotten their hands firmly around that. Rick. I think in uh, recent years, really probably going back to the Community Reinvestment Act, it you know, seemed like increasing pressure over time to allocate credit more you know, for reasons other than uh, credit standards, whether it's uh, uh, political or social reasons, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, banks in particular seem under a lot of pressure to, to you know, adjust their lending to, to meet some of these criteria. And then more recently, Well, again, uh, because the stress analyses look at the, the characteristics of the loan, the credit quality of the loan, to the extent that societal pressure, for example, is, is encouraging to, to, to uh, lend to leaker credits, that would be reflected. And then in addition, um, there are estimates in there uh, of both the so-called mortgage putback risk, which is a very big risk for the largest firms, and that was estimated by, again, drilling down into the characteristics of the securitizations that they sponsored and, and looking uh, what the loss experience is and then looking at um, what the experience to date has been in terms of the ability of, of whether it's uh, uh, private mortgage back uh, uh, holders or, or the, or the uh, insurers or Fannie and Freddie to actually put those back. So those, those are included and then further uh, there are estimates uh, included of their potential losses uh, for, for uh, 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 poor performance in their mortgage servicing fun functions, to put it uh, abstractly. So is, but could you quantify that at all? Or do you have a sense as to how important that is? I think it's quite important for a, a couple of banks. Again, the, the you know, simply, uh, uh, I think it's well known that, that in terms of, of uh, Originations of mortgages and mortgage servicing. There are a couple of banks that just uh, have uh, hugely more activity than than the other banks. But we had we had data on all of that and incorporated that. And it's again, it's it's you could say it. It's only relevant to a handful of banks. But of course, those banks are among the very largest, so it was an important element in the test. Um, so there's always this question of liquidity versus solvency, right? If you Every time the short-term funding markets dry up, the shareholders get wiped out, no one's ever going to buy a bank stock, right? So there has to be this lender of last resort. To the public, though, every kind of support looks like a bailout and to politicians these days, even on the left and on the right. Um, how, how do you deal with that? Because it's a fine line. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think this term bailout is, is they're using the term bailout to describe a whole spectrum of arrangements, some of which are pretty close to pure liquidity provision, um, and some of which are bailouts. Uh, uh, and, and I think really, I mean, of course, if it's Fed lending, it's always against collateral. But during the crisis, we, we uh, accepted some forms of collateral that uh, there's no way we'd have done that before the crisis. But you know, for example, for those of you from Chicago, I was in, in Chicago yesterday and was hearing that the Fed's ability to provide liquidity to central counterparties is making them too big to fail, and it says the government's going to bail them out. I mean, again, I, I, don't, I don't know, I haven't followed our latest uh, decision making in terms of exactly how we characterize the circumstances in the terms of which we lend, but sort of the, the, the market dysfunction that was motivating that is that certain clearing organizations have treasury bills in their clearing funds. 
Uh, but of course, if they're to complete settlement in a timely way, they have to be able to borrow against those treasury bills, and they were encountering increasing difficulty getting banks that were willing to lend, because I think the bank realizes the circumstances in which a clearing organization is going to need liquidity, that's going to be an ugly day in the financial system, so they're reluctant to provide that kind of liquidity. And at least uh, I'm willing to defend uh, the Fed lending against T-bills to complete settlement uh, on, on derivatives or securities exchanges or payment systems. And you can call that if you if a bailout if you want, but clearly that uh, that's a different kind of bailout than the maiden lane vehicles that we created. Let's just put it that way. I think we better continue our discussion All right. over the break, which is now a 15-minute break, or a half-hour break. But I think we can